do you want to win a fly tying mega kit that comes with everything you need to start fly tying? We're talking the vice, the tools, the materials. Yeah, who wouldn't want that? Listen to the podcast and you will find out how you can be entered to win a fly tying mega kit from Ventures Fly Co. This is Untangled Fly Fishing for Everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled, and I am your host, Spencer Durant. Apologies to those of you who watch the video podcast. The SD card in my camera bit the dust today, so that means I had to switch over to the laptop camera to get footage for the video podcast. And, you know, you're probably asking yourself, well, uh, Durant, why didn't you just go to uh, the store and get a new one? Well, you see, the nearest place that sells an SD card is probably like an hour away. So that's a little bit of a of a trek, you know, an hour there, an hour back. And that's if I go directly into the store and I don't stop for fast food and whatnot, because we don't have fast food in this little town in Wyoming where I live. So it, it's gotten to the point where Wendy's is a treat these days. and I don't really like what that says about me. So apologies uh, for those of you getting my ugly mug in less than HD this week. Although come to think of it, that may actually be a blessing. (laughs) But we've got a wonderful, wonderful show put together for you today. We're going to be talking about catching picky fish, the best way to handle those fish that just don't seem to want any of the flies in your box. We're going to be talking about how it's not specific flies that catch fish. I know that seems counterproductive, but I'll explain that. Don't worry. We'll also be chatting about the factory loop on fly line and how to see your dry flies when they're out there on the water. Oh, and I almost forgot. We've got a wonderful little giveaway getting put together here just for listeners of the podcast. If you are the 100th person to submit a question for the show. We've got a fair amount of questions and we're we're creeping close to that 100 number. I'm not going to tell you how far away we are from it cuz <laughs> I want a lot of questions, but we're, we're close enough that I reckon in the next couple of weeks we're going to hit that and in fact Alex is going to join me in 2 weeks for episode 21. So you'll definitely want to mark that. And we're going to announce the winner uh of this little contest during episode 21. So if you submit your question, you're the hundredth person, you are going to win the fly tying mega kit from us. That means you've got your vice, all the tools and a beginner materials pack. Plus the fly tying masterclass. You get all of that for free. We'll send it to you. It's our way of saying thank you for participating in the podcast and making this so much fun for me to do every week and for all of us here at VFC to get to know folks and really build this community and turn this into what we want it to be, which is the place and a resource where we can all share our skills and our knowledge to help each other become better anglers, right? That's that's the whole goal. That's been the point of Untangled since we started it. So if you want to get started into fly tying, you know, this is a pretty good giveaway. I would recommend getting those questions in. You can submit a question via the link in the podcast description. And if you're that hundredth person, <laughs> you're going to be real lucky and real happy. It's going to be like Christmas in May. I think that's probably when we'll send it out. But again, thanks for all the questions that we've had so far. And let's just let's just dive right in. All right. Uh, I want to open the show today. I want to do it a little bit differently. I want to open the show with a story. I was out fishing on, when was it? Saturday. I was out fishing Saturday and floating a river that I'd never floated before. I fished it, but I've never floated it. And my buddy and I get down, oh, we're, it's probably five-ish o'clock in the afternoon. There'd been a decent blue wing hatch, but the fish weren't really on them. They were, they were chowing down on the nymphs. They were... They were eating scuds like it was going out of style. <laughs> they were eating scuds like me at a buffet of wings, okay? Just left and right, you get them in there, you know, going chipmunks with your cheeks on it. <laughs> kind of, kind of, uh, that's how the fish were eating. 
But we get down and we finally see a pretty good fish working the surface. He's sitting there on the inside of a seam coming up pretty regularly and just sipping bugs off the top. And it was really kind of frustrating because I assumed that he was eating midges, even though we'd seen a lot of blue wings earlier in the day. I'd assumed that this guy was eating midges because the blue wing hatch was over. We hadn't seen any blue wing duns in a couple hours by that point. It was five in the afternoon. And there hadn't been a ton of blue wings. I thought there hadn't been a ton of blue wings anyways to make enough of like a spinner fall for the trout to be keying in on that. So we sat there. Me and my buddy, I was on the oars at that point, and my buddy was fishing to this guy because he let me catch a lot of fish. So I said, no, take take this fish. So my buddy is fishing to this trout, and we threw midge pattern after midge pattern after midge pattern. We went with two dry flies. We went with a dry and a dropper. We went with, I didn't think we went with two nymphs, but we started throwing all sorts of off-the-wall things at this. Unweighted nymphs trying to do emergers, cripples. I think I even tied a clink hammer on at one point. They could not get this fish to bite. We spent probably 45 minutes throwing flies at this thing. And finally, I looked at my buddy. His name's Joe. I looked at Joe and I said, Joe, we're going to catch this fish before we get out of here. Boats have gone by us, right? The best fishing on this stretch of the river is actually downstream of where we were and we're hung up on one little fish here doesn't make a whole lot of sense but and in wyoming you know you can't the access laws are kind of weird uh for for riverbed stuff so we had to be in the boat to actually cast to this fish so i'm sitting there on the oars keeping the boat in position and joe's casting to it finally i pulled the one thing out of my box that i hadn't tried yet and that was a blue wing cripple pattern. Well, I tie it on, and lo and behold, like like Joe's fifth cast, he sticks this fish. Big, beautiful rainbow, like 18 inch, real thick though. Uh, really a pretty big fish. The best fish that we caught all day actually was Joe's on that dry fly. And I share this story not to say, oh look at me, I figured that fish out. <laughs> oh, oh, oh yes, I'm. Much better than you peasants. No, no. And that's and if you've listened to this show at all, you know that's not the uh, the tack I go for at all. Uh, I share this story, though, to drive home the importance of observing the fish and the bugs. Because I finally went to that blue wing cripple pattern, not just because it was the last thing in my box. I kind of oversimplified that. I went to that blue wing cripple pattern because... There were a lot of midges on the water, but this fish obviously wasn't eating midges because we floated a bunch of midge patterns past him. So I start taking a longer look at the water, and I do start to see some crippled blue wing patterns coming down, which tells me, okay, maybe he is keyed in. Maybe he doesn't want the billion midges. Maybe he wants those blue wings, those slightly bigger mayflies. So I paid attention to my surroundings, right? We've talked about this a ton uh it on the podcast we've also done a whole blog series on the vfc blog about how to pick a fly and we talk about the importance of paying attention to your surroundings looking at what's on the water right paying attention to that and making your fly choice based off of that so i finally you know took a second to look closely at what was on the water but when i did that within five casts joe had that fish so there's a lot of importance to paying attention to the surroundings like we've talked about and really looking at what's coming down in the water because the fish won't always be keyed in on the main thing that's hatching. Uh, I've fished some hatches on the green river before where there's some caddis and some yellow sallies coming off at the same time. And there are moments when you will run into a fish that is eating only yellow sallies and ignoring every caddis that's on the water. Those instances happen. They're rare, but having the skill set to diagnose those situations and walk away from it, putting a trout in the net, that's key because that's the sort of skill set that's going to help you no matter what you're trying to do fly fishing-wise. So I share that story just to 
hopefully help drive home uh, that little uh, that lesson for us. And that actually segues us beautifully into the first question of this week's show, which is Co. Hope I'm pronouncing it right. It's written K O. So Co from California. He says, I love fly fishing, but I'm having a hard time catching trout. What fly should I use if I just want to catch something? P.S. I love your podcast and love the videos your company makes. Diet Coke for the win. Well, Co, you're already in my good graces because Diet Coke for the win, right? I mean, who would say that Coke Zero is superior? I mean, certainly not Alex. And I can't remember if Bertrand even has an opinion on that one. I'm going to have to ask him and bug him. Uh, Co, you are a smart man, though. Diet Coke is where it's at. I am really glad that you're enjoying the podcast. We also, you talked about our videos. We're going to have some fun videos coming up soon, so stay tuned for those. Your question, Co, is one that I hear a lot, and I always like to answer it on the podcast for folks who may not have heard it answered before because it's something that a lot of beginners have questions about, and rightfully so, because it just seems like, well, I can tie on a fly and just catch fish, right? You go out on the river and you see folks catching fish and you ask them, what are you catching fish on? Usually it's a fly that's different from what you're using. So that concept of the fly being the magic ticket, the silver bullet, if you will, that that exists. And I certainly think uh, conventional fishing has done a lot to further that idea as well because you get into uh, certain jigs and crankbaits and soft baits and hard baits and whatever else it is. And there's going to be some that just really trigger a bite. The thing with fly fishing though, to remember is you're not picking your flies based on the, Oh, well, this is the magic fly that works all the time, no matter what that doesn't really exist. All right. You're a midge pattern or a woolly bugger. It is the closest you're going to get to a magic all-around fly that works in any fishing situation. Because the key with fly fishing, you are picking flies to use based on what's on the water. Just like in that story I shared, I was picking the flies based on the fact that I saw a bunch of midges on the stream when I really should have been picking flies based on the blue wings that were there. Now, Again, that's kind of a more complicated case. I was on a tailwater, too, so that kind of ups the ante a little bit. Tailwater trout tend to be a lot pickier than trout in a freestone uh, stream or spring creek, right? So you should be picking flies based on what you observe when you go to the river. What's hatching? Are the trout even rising on dry flies? If not, pick up a rock. Look at the nymphs. See what's crawling underneath there. That information helps you decide which fly you're going to use. And I wrote a seven-part blog series about this very topic. So if you're not sure how to pick the right fly for your fishing, then you definitely need to read it. That's going to be linked in the podcast description. So you can go through that, Co. And that really, I spent a lot of time putting that together. The whole team at VFC, we, you know, I do the writing, but Alex does yeoman's work with the editing portion of it too. Every good writer needs an even better editor. So we put that together to help answer this question. It's a question that I get a lot, I hear a lot, and so I always appreciate the opportunity to answer that. So thank you, Co, for le- for giving me the chance to answer that question. All right, next question comes to us. Craig from Utah writes in and says, the factory loop on my fly line where I attach my leader is wearing and needs to be redone. I know how to tie a nail knot and could just do that, but prefer a nice low profile loop. How do I properly redo the loop on my fly line? Hey Craig, that's actually a really good question. It's a pretty fun topic to chat about too. Uh, I actually prefer not to use any loops in my fly line at all. Um, I know a lot of anglers who just cut off the welt of the loop altogether and just do a nail knot. My grandpa, uh, he didn't do loops. Now, granted, he was fishing before welded loops on fly line were really a thing. 
But what he did that I actually really liked is he would, oh, and this was such a pain in the butt. He would heat up a needle, not like like a sewing needle, right? He'd heat up a sewing needle until it was red hot, and then he would stab it into the fly line to create like a hole in the fly line around the braided core. And then he would take the needle out real quick, and while it was still hot, he would get a piece of, he'd get his leader, and he would super glue the leader into that little hole. And that was actually a bomb-proof connection, but good criminy. Getting it to, getting the hole created without melting the, the fly line coating, and then getting the leader to stick in there was just, it was mind-numbingly mad and just frustrating to try and do that and make it happen. So I definitely don't recommend going that route. And I do recommend, though, Craig, uh, I do recommend using the nail knot connection. I think it's superior for a couple of reasons. I'm a, I'll share those with you. First off, it's a lot lower profile of a connection than a loop. Any loop-to-loop connection that you use is going to have the blunt end of some leader material that will get hung up in your guides at some point because it sticks out at a 90-degree angle from the perfection loop, right? You tie your perfection loop, and when you cut that tag end off, there's always going to be a little piece that sticks out. And then the bump of the, the knot itself right below the loop that's always going to be something that sticks out right there. That's always going to cause a friction that gives the leader something to snag on when it's in the guides. And I've, so I build fly rods too, and I, I do some bamboo and I do, do a lot of graphite, but well, I, I said that wrong. I do way more bamboo than I do graphite. It's been a long day, if you guys can't tell. But I I can't help but wonder if we're doing a number on our guides and the epoxy and the thread that holds them on to the rods. If we're putting so much stress, you know, banging into the guides with that blunt end of the loop. You know, think of when you're trying to uh, pull line out, like if you have... Uh, a really long leader and you've got leader halfway down your guides and you're trying to pull that line up through the guides and your fly line gets stuck on something, right? It's usually that loop to loop connection. That's getting it stuck on one of the guides. And you just, I mean, if you get impatient like me, you probably just yank it. That can't be good for the guides. And it, it's just, I, I've had the loop to loop connection snag before when, uh, the fish is pulling line off of the reel. And when you're reeling in close, it doesn't always want to go cleanly through the tip top. It's just a very clunky connection sometimes. And again, this is my experience. I'm by no means, uh, I am by no means trying to set the table for the whole industry here at all. Uh, But those are problems that I've experienced. So I would recommend doing a nail knot you're going to improve your fishing experience that way. I promise just nail knot to your leader, uh, cut the welded loop off of your fly line and you'll be in business. Now that being said, if you're really sold on the loop to loop connection, it is not that hard to make a new welded loop in your fly line. All you're going to need is some heat shriek tubing and a lighter. There's actually a wonderful video from the folks over at in the riffle I'm going to link that in the podcast description for you as well. And really, it's a really simple process. All you're going to do is make a loop in your fly line. You put the heat heat shrink tubing over that. You use a lighter to kind of fuse that fly line together. And then you remove the tubing and boom, you've just made yourself a welded loop in your fly line. It's a very simple process. Again, though, I would highly suggest going over to the nail knot system If you do that, Craig, I promise you're going to thank me. All right. It's just a smoother connection all around. And I'm actually in the process of cutting off all of the perfection loops and welded loops on my fly lines and moving to that uh, full time with all my, all my reels. Cause it's just, 
it's such a uh, it's such a smoother experience. I keep coming back to that, but that, that's what it is. I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. So thank you very much for that question. That was a great question. Really appreciate the opportunity to answer that one, Craig. All right, and just like that, we are coming to the end of the show. This is the last question. So before we go ahead and do this last question, just a reminder, if you have any questions for the show, please go ahead and submit those to us. There's always a link in the podcast description. And don't forget, if you can submit the 100th question, if you can be the 100th person to put a question in for us, you are going to win the fly tying mega kit. So it's definitely something you don't want to miss out on. Now this last question, we doubled up on uh, folks from Utah. So way on, way, way, way to go Utah for representing. (laughs) I appreciate it. Clint from Utah writes in and says, I often struggle to see my dry flies. I don't have the best vision. Do you have any tricks to help with seeing dry flies? I know you can get some high vis or parachute versions, but my guess is that it's hard to do for all dry flies. Do you ever use an indicator with a dry fly? Clint, this is an interesting question, and actually took me quite a bit of time like to think through this stuff myself and go over my own methods for how I see dry flies and to bug a few fishing buddies and other folks and say, hey, what tips do you have for this? Because... You know, I know how I would say this, but I like to gather a ton of information before I answer a question so that I can present it to to you guys and give you hopefully a, a really wide uh, wide view of information so there's a ton for you to go through. So with that in mind, I'm going to actually answer the last part of your question first. Yes, I will use an indicator, and I put air quotes around that word, with a dry fly lot, what I mean by that is I will just usually fish a larger dry fly in front of a smaller one. I do that a ton. Just a few weeks ago, actually blue wing olive hatch here in Wyoming, not the one that I was on on Saturday. The blue wings have been going pretty well here. It's It's been really nice. The spring has like started to pretend to show up in Wyoming. We're still supposed to get a bunch of snow, but we've at least got blue wings hatching. Anyways, I'm out there, I'm fishing this blue wing hatch, and I had a size 16 blue wing on, uh, just a dun, and then I had a size 18 sparkle dun, about 18 inches behind it. Sparkle duns, by the way, are wonderful flies. That's, they are almost a magic bullet for a mayfly hatch. I love sparkle duns. They, I don't leave the house without a couple dozen of them. So I I don't know how to give a uh, more ringing endorsement of that. Now, if you've fished with me before, you might say, well, I'm not going to use what that Durant guy fishes with. (laughs) But that's really only Bertrand who would say that. So he he likes his own creations. But Sparkle Dunce, they're wonderful, all right? Uh, They're just, they're the fly that keeps on giving is, is really what they are. Anyways, those sparkle nuns, if you've fished them before, you know that they sit really low. Often they're completely submerged. That's why they're such a great fly. And even if they're not submerged, it's still really hard to see them because they're very sparsely tied. And I I don't even know if I've ever fished a sparkle nun by itself. It is very common to fish a smaller dry fly behind a larger one, and you use that larger one as the indicator. You see a fish come up, you see your bigger dry fly move or go down, you know, all right, time to set that hook because something ate the smaller dry fly. Or the benefit is sometimes a fish will just go ahead and chomp on your bigger dry fly and you don't have to worry about trying to see the smaller one anyways. As far as a real indicator goes, no, you don't really want to use a uh, like a plastic indicator of any kind because it's going to mess up the drift and the presentation. And on top of that, you don't want to plop a big old plastic bobber down on a, on top of a whole bunch of rising fish. That's a surefire way to spook those fish. 
And then, you know, you're not, you don't even have the opportunity to catch them. At least with a fly that you have a hard time seeing, you have that opportunity to catch them, right? But you, you don't have that if you're throwing that bobber down on the water on top of them. And I do want to add the method of using the larger dry fly and then a smaller dry fly behind it. That's not going to decrease your chances of catching fish. That's a very common way to fish especially these mayfly hatches with really small mayflies. It's, it's something that I know a ton of veteran anglers do. I know, a lot, uh, I know quite a few guides who do it as well. So you don't need to worry about that potentially ruining your chances at catching some nice fish. Now, as far as actually seeing the dry flies go, well, just be a young guy like me, okay? It's not that hard. <laughs> no. I actually had this conversation with Joe on the water the other day because he's a little bit older than me, <coughs> a lot, <coughs> and I will make fun of my fishing buddies for just about anything and everything. The one thing I refuse to do is to make fun of them for their vision because I know, I know that is coming for me. At some point in my life, I'm going to go to tie on a fly and realize, oh shoot, I can't see this, and I just pray that there's somebody around who's willing to tie those flies on for me, all right? And, you know, I'm actually going to go out here and issue an edict to any younger fly fisher who is out with an older fly fisher. Let them know, hey, I will tie your flies on for you. No judgment. Now, they might get offended. They might yell at you, I'm not that old. (laughs) Shut up, you whippersnapper. But I promise they're actually going to be kind of touched that you offered, (laughs) all right? And then, you know, bonus points, you get to, you know, practice your knots, get better at your knots. Everything goes wonderfully like that. Uh, Anyways, back to your question, Clint. Uh, As far as actually seeing the dry flies go, I think it's kind of different for everybody. I actually use a lot of yellow and white posts for my parachute flies. I tend to see those easier than other colors lighter color hair or wings that you use under dry flies, the better for seeing them usually. Uh, light elk hair works really well for elk hair caddis flies. It just provides a good contrast. And that's usually going to be the first step into in seeing those flies is looking for that contrast. Uh, so if you're tying your flies, use lighter wings, use lighter hair. That's worked for me. Uh, experiment with different colors, right? Grab different colors, grab different shades, go out on the water with them and kind of tweak that your way. It's actually pretty easy to tie like a high-vis version of anything. Uh, I actually have a buddy who he will tie like a high-vis fuchsia parachute post into almost any fly. He does that with his Griffiths gnats even. Uh, It doesn't affect the fly at all. And it makes it super easy to see. And the fish don't care because they're not seeing the the part of the fly that has the parachute post sticking out. They're seeing the the bottom of the fly, which, you know, when you think about that, it's kind of interesting how much effort we put into making these flies when all the fish see is the bottom of it. (laughs) Anyways. uh, So if you are tying your own flies, though, Clint, uh, experiment with different posts like that uh there's usually a lot of videos on like how to tie a high vis griffiths net and if not i know we're going to be putting stuff out like that in the near future too here at venture so you know stay tuned and we'll we'll keep you covered there i do want to ask you a question though before i move on to any more tips that i've got clint uh are you wearing polarized sunglasses that's going to make a huge difference huge in how well you're able to actually see your dry flies. Make sure you've got polarized sunglasses, not just regular. The polarized glasses cut the glare. They are actually worth the extra money. They're going to cut that glare and help you see your flies better. Uh, And then there's three more tips that we're going to run through here. Uh, First off, you can also try making shorter casts. If if the, it's a distance problem, like you can't see it at 60 feet, but you can see it at 40 feet, right? That means you're going to have to get closer to the fish. 
You're going to have to work on your stealth a little bit, but you know that's that's going to be one way to help you uh, ensure that you're able to see your flies. I'm actually a really big fan of dry shakes. So this would be my second tip for you. I'm actually a really big fan of the dry shake or brush on dry floatant because it makes the flies super visible, right? It's like, you know, it's like looking for uh, the cowboy in the airport. You know, the, the boots, the buckles, and the hat stands out like a sore thumb. The, uh, the dry shake or the dry floatant does the same thing, actually. It's kind of nice. Um, and then the last tip that I'm going to leave you with here is that the less you focus on trying to see the fly, the better. I know that's counterintuitive. I know it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it actually, it actually works. <laughs> like, I, I don't know how else to describe it other than you've got to go out and try it for yourself, but it actually does work. If you can't see the fly after it lands, just look in the general area of where you think it landed, and you'll probably end up being able to spot it. And if you still can't, then set the hook on any fish that rises where you think your fly is. If you can, find the end of your leader and follow that up to where you think the fly is as well. George Anderson actually wrote a great story about this in Fly Fisherman Magazine back in 1987. And I actually have a copy of it linked in the podcast description as well. There is one quote from his story that I want to share. Uh, It goes along with this tip. He says, It sounds easy, but difficulty spotting the fly is the reason most fly fishermen have trouble fishing small dries. People watching me fish tiny mayfly or midge patterns often ask how I can see my fly on the water among all the naturals. Most of the time I can't, but I have a good idea where the fly is, and if I see a fish rise within a foot of where I think the fly is riding, I set the hook. It's surprising how often that rise is to your fly. But if you don't react, you'll be lucky to catch any fish. So that story that George wrote is all about fishing small dry flies, but it applies to what we're talking about here with learning how to see flies. If you're accurate with your cast and you know where your fly should be, right? After that, it's just a matter of watching the fish and setting when they rise somewhere near where your fly should be. So if you know you're an accurate fly caster, look in the general area, you'll be you'll be in business. Now, does that sound ridiculous? A bit, but George really knows his stuff. George Anderson's an incredible angler, great teacher. He knows his stuff. You're going to listen to anybody, listen to George. And this is the same technique that I use. Uh, I know guides use it. A bunch of my fishing buddies use it as well. You're not going to always see your dry fly. You have to trust that where you cast is where the fly ended up and set when a fish rises in that general area. You just got to build up that confidence to start setting the hook, even if you can't see your dry fly all the time. Hopefully some of those tips help, Clint. And if not, write back in. Let me know how, uh, how uh, if there's anything else that I could do to help you with that. And that folks, is going to wrap up the show. Remember, the Fly Tying Mega Kit is on the table. So if you want advice, tools, the Fly Tying Masterclass, and a beginner materials pack, go ahead and submit your questions for the podcast because the 100th question submitted is going to win that Mega Fly Tying Kit. Right? And don't forget, Alex is going to be on the show in two weeks. Uh, episode 21 will be announcing the winner of the fly tying mega kit that day and alex and i are going to do a deep dive into a into one single topic so it's going to be a narrower focus but we're going to go a little bit deeper on one topic for a show so it should be a lot of fun and we're really excited for all you folks to join us and in the meantime get out there get fishing and tight lines everybody <laughs>